Thank you very much for joining us at our virtual CMSC meeting. My name is Pat Melville. I'm from Stony Brook University in New York, and I'm going to be talking to you today about comorbidities and MS. We're going to be talking about their frequency and the impact on DMT selection. In support of improving patient care, the CMSC is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This presentation offers one contact hour of continuing education for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, PAs, psychologists, and social workers. This is my disclosure slide. Today's objectives are to identify common comorbidities occurring in MS patients, to examine the impact of comorbidities on the MS disease process, to utilize critical thinking in the management of comorbidities and the use of disease modifying therapies, and the learner will be able to educate and counsel patients on the importance of lifestyle modifications in the prevention of comorbidities. So what are comorbidities? Comorbidities refer to the total burden of illness other than the specific disease of interest. They are distinct and separate from the expected complications of the specific disease. MS patients have adverse health outcomes associated with comorbidities, some of which include delay and complications of diagnosis. MS patients may have reduced functional status. They may have increased utilization of healthcare services reduce quality of life. Comorbidities are a poor prognostic marker and MS patients are at increased risk of disability progression if they have comorbidities. Comorbidities have a negative impact on lesion burden. Patients with MS with comorbidities have increased mortality rates and comorbidities do impact treatment decisions. The pathogenesis of comorbidities in MS is very complex. There are a number of studies going on now looking at genetic predisposition, some in the area of cardiovascular disease, looking at the HNF1A gene as a cardiovascular risk factor and the lipid metabolism gene. There's also a number of large genomic studies that are ongoing with psychiatric disorders, including bipolar disease, depression, and schizophrenia. We know that the environment may also play a role in the development of comorbidities, poor health behaviors such as obesity, lack of exercise, smoking, substance abuse may contribute to comorbidities, and pollutants, particularly air pollutants, may also contribute, although there is conflicting data on that. Patients with MS who have other chronic inflammatory disorders may be at increased risk for inflammation, which in turn has a negative impact on brain health. And use of disease-modifying therapies may also come with complications and adverse events that can promote comorbidities. Comorbidities in MS have a negative impact on the brain tissue and the central nervous system reserve. We know that they assault the central nervous system. The comorbidities that we see most prevalent in MS are depression and anxiety, followed by hypertension and hyperlipidemia and chronic lung disease. The most prevalent immune-mediated disorders that we see in MS are thyroid disease and psoriasis. Malignancies can also occur in MS. The most common cancers that we see are cervical, breast, and digestive system. Patients with MS may be at increased risk for meningiomas and urinary system cancers. There was a recently published study from Norway looking at data from their national MS registry. They looked at MS patients, about 6,800, siblings of MS patients, 8,900, and a control group of 37,000. What they found is that the cancer risk is increased in MS patients compared to the control group. Majority of the cancers that they saw were those involving the respiratory organs, urinary organs, and central nervous system. Interestingly, in this study, they noticed that siblings of MS patients had an increased risk for hematological cancer. Comorbidities can increase mortality in MS. The most frequent causes of death in MS patients can be from MS indirectly, complications of MS, cardiovascular disease, cancer, accidents and suicide, 
and respiratory and infectious disease. And we'll go through that in a little bit more depth as we go through the slides. In a meta-analysis, um, MS patients had almost three times the death rate versus the general population. The increased mortality was primarily due to cardiovascular disease, one and a quarter times the general population, suicide over twice the general population, infection and respiratory disease 2.9 uh, over the general population. Beta interferon was associated with a lower mortality risk among relapsing MS patients, and this was based on a study that was done in Canada from 1980 to 2004, and in France from 1976 to 2013. We know that females have a survival disadvantage over males, and we know that MS patients have a shorter lifespan than the general population by about six to seven years. This is information from a North American and European cohort, depression uh, and anxiety, the two most common comorbidities that we see, 23% for depression, 21% for anxiety, hypertension, 18.6%, hyperlipidemia and chronic lung disease, about 10% each. Frequency of comorbidities in MS, this is information from an Australian study from 2005. They looked at 198 MS patients. They saw a higher prevalence of hypertension, dyslipidemia, asthma, psoriasis, eczema, and anemia. The multiple sclerosis severity scale was increased in obese MS patients and also dyslipidemia. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis and anemia had a higher relapse risk. Impact, comorbidities can also impact MS diagnosis. Um, we, we mentioned a moment ago that there may be longer diagnostic delays. In a Danish study looking at 8,900 MS patients, they saw that there were delays in diagnosis in patients with cerebrovascular, cardiovascular, lung disease, diabetes, and cancer. There may also be an increased rate of mortality in patients, MS patients with psychiatric disorders, cerebrovascular disease, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, diabetes, and Parkinson's disease. Hospitalizations are also increased with MS patients and comorbidities. Looking at a Canadian retrospective review, which looked at patients over a period from 1996 to 2017, MS patients with comorbidity had an increased rate of all cause hospitalizations. Patients with diabetes, ischemic heart disease, chronic lung disease, epilepsy, and mood disorders had an increased rate of all-cause hospitalizations, but interestingly enough, little impact on MS-related hospitalizations. Hospitalization was higher during the early stages of MS, which may speak to the fact that patients were in more the relapsing stage of the disease at that point. The takeaway message from this is that recognizing and managing comorbidities early in the disease course is going to have a positive impact. Comorbidity can also affect relapse risk. This is information from a Canadian study. They looked at four separate MS centers, a total of 885 patients. And what they did is they examined the relationship between comorbid conditions at baseline, and they looked at the relapse rate over a period of two years. The most common comorbidities were anxiety and depression, which we've seen on the prior slides, hypertension, migraine, and hyperlipidemia. What they found is that MS patients with three or more comorbidities had a higher relapse rate. MS patients with migraine and hyperlipidemia each had an increased risk of relapses over two years. There are some sex differences in uh, comorbidities. We can see the males are the uh, lighter blue, the females are the darker blue, and we can see with males um, hypertension, heart disease, and hyperlipidemia is more so in men than in women. In women you see more problems with depression, anxiety, and lung disease. This is another slide looking at sex differences. This is looking at a Swedish study, a Swedish database over a period of uh, 44 years from 1968 to 2012. They looked at 25,000 patients with MS and they had a general population comparator group of 250,000. Males with MS had a higher comorbidity burden compared with females. Both sexes had an, had an 
a higher comorbidity disease burden compared to the general population. In males, the comorbid disease burden was primarily renal, respiratory, and cardiovascular disease. In females, it was depression and autoimmune disorders. Cardiovascular risk factors, 489 MS patients versus 175 healthy controls. They evaluated hypertension, heart disease, smoking, obesity, and type one diabetes. Hypertension and smoking were elevated in MS. MS patients were more likely to have greater than three risk factors or rather comorbidities and greater than two comorbidities uh, as compared to the general population. And you can see the frequency of three or more cardiovascular risk factors was 18% compared to 8% in the general population. And in the case of two comorbidities or greater, 49% in the MS population versus 36% in the general population. Comorbidities also have an impact on brain volume. Patients with MS with hypertension and heart disease showed decreased gray matter and cortical volume. MS patients with obesity had an increased T1 lesion volume, and patients with MS who smoked had a decrease in brain volume. Vascular comorbidities, uh, this is information from the NARCOMS registry looking at 8,900 MS patients. What they found is that MS patients with more than one comorbidity at any time during the MS disease course had an increased risk of ambulatory disability. The risk increased with the number of vascular conditions. The median time between MS diagnosis and need for ambulatory assistance was quite striking. Those without vascular comorbidities was 18 years, and those with vascular comorbidities was 12 years. And once again, this was the need for ambulatory assistance. So that's quite striking. Comorbidities have an impact on MS. In a Canadian study looking at over 10,000 MS patients, 50% of the study population had one or more comorbidities. They took data from a, a clinic and administrative databases. Ischemic heart disease and epilepsy each increase the risk of higher EDSS in the MS population. And the increased number of comorbidities was associated with reduced likelihood of initiation of disease-modifying therapy. Individually, ischemic heart disease and or anxiety, there was decreased initiation of disease-modifying therapy. Autoimmune thyroid disease, again, information from a Canadian cohort looking at 328 MS patients. There was a co-occurrence co with Graves' disease, but no significant co-occurrence with Hashimoto's disease. Autoimmune disease also has impact on brain volume. In this particular study, they looked at 286 MS patients. Uh, from that population, 10% had type 1 diabetes, 18% had autoimmune thyroiditis, and 0.1% with celiac disease. What they found is that there's an association between type 1 diabetes and lower gray matter and cortical gray matter independent from MS features and related to the duration of type 1 diabetes. In another study looking at MS patients with comorbidities, 241 patients, 11.9% had thyroid disease, asthma, type 2 diabetes, and psoriasis, all about 4 to 5%, and rheumatoid arthritis, a little over 2%. Psoriasis, thyroid disease, and type 2 diabetes comorbidities were associated with decreased whole brain, cortical, and gray matter volume. And they use the Sienna uh, as the tool for measuring brain volume with this particular study. Osteoporosis, um, we worry about bone health with our MS patients because they, we know that they're at increased risk of osteoporosis due to several factors, impaired mobility, physical inactivity, uh, lack of weight bearing activities may put them at increased risk for osteoporosis. We know many of our MS patients have low vitamin D levels, and this could result in reduced bone mass, use of steroid therapy, and use of anticonvulsant therapies all increases the risk of osteoporosis. In this study, they looked at 40 MS patients, and these were male patients. The mean age was 51.2 years, and the mean EDSS was 5.8. 80% of those patients had decreased bone mass of the lumbar spine or femoral neck. 
42% had osteopenia, 37% had osteoporosis, and 21% or a quarter of them had fractures, either vertebral, rib, or extremities. We've talked a lot about depression and anxiety as a comorbidity, um, and we know that depression is very common. Um, in this particular series, they identified 38.8% and anxiety symptoms of 27%. In a Canadian cohort, they looked at 2,300 MS patients. They, they found that the lifetime incidence of mood or anxiety disorder was 35%. And we, we, they found that the presence of a mood or anxiety disorder was associated with a higher EDSS. This mood and anxiety disorders were more prevalent in females uh, compared to males. This is more information about psychiatric comorbidities. This is looking at a Swedish na nationwide cohort, looking at 5,800 MS patients. They found a higher EDSS score in female MS patients who had comorbid depression. There was risk of disability worsening in both males and females with comorbid depression. And depression may be related to feelings of hopelessness. We know that MS patients with depression may, may, uh, may have negative health behaviors. They may not be adherent to their medication. They may uh, be smoking. They may be less likely to exercise. They may be more prone to using substances or abusing substances. This is another um, interesting uh, phenomenon that we see uh, with our MS patients, and that's polypharmacy. Uh, this particular uh, article looked at a meta-analysis of seven studies. They define polypharmacy as, patient be as patients being on five or greater medications. Across the seven studies, the rate of polypharmacy was 15 to 59%. Patients who are at risk for polypharmacy are those with multiple comorbidities and with chronic illnesses. Polypharmacy is associated with increased disability, cognitive deficits, increased rate of hospitalization, increased relapse rate, and decreased quality of life. So how do we manage comorbidities in our patients? Well, we really need to follow a multidisciplinary and a multidimensional approach. We have our MS care team, but certainly having primary care involved and any other specialist as necessary, whether it be cardiology or endocrinology. And we really wanna encourage our patients to integrate lifestyle management with conventional medicine. We want to reduce modifiable risk factors, smoking cessation, physical inactivity, obesity, diet, healthy eating, substance and alcohol abuse. We wanna make sure we promptly recognize any comorbid conditions and we begin appropriate treatment as necessary. Lifestyle modifications or wellness is, is necessary for all of our MS patients. It may improve quality of life. We want our patients to engage in practicing healthy eating habits. We want them to reduce or eliminate tobacco and alcohol use, maintain a healthy BMI. We want them to have some sort of physical activity uh, as much as possible, even those that are wheelchair confined. We want to improve their sleep and we want to help them with stress reduction and management. The AAN and ECTRMS and the European Society have given us some practice guidelines. In 2008, the AAN published practice guidelines. Their recommendation number five was when initiating a disease modifying therapy, counsel about comorbid disease, adverse health behaviors, and potential interactions of DMT with concomitant medications. And that was a level B recommendation. Ectrums has two recommendations. For active relapsing MS, DMT choice in part depends on patient characteristics and comorbidities, and that was a consensus. And then when deciding on a DMT switch, in consultation with the patient, consider patient characteristics and comorbidities among other factors. And again, that was a sense consensus. We'll talk now individually about the comorbidities and their effect on the individual uh, DMTs. First, we'll talk about the injectables um, and primarily focusing in on the interferon betas. So um, the interferon beta is their contraindications, considerations, and warnings. You want to assess your patients if they're having issues with depression or suicidal thoughts. We're going to monitor them for lymphopenia and thrombocytopenia. 
We're going to monitor them for abnormal hepatic function before initiating therapy. We're going to be aware if they have thyroid disease prior to initiating therapy and then monitoring that periodically while they're on therapy. For women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, this is going to be a case-by-case -case basis where you're going to weigh the risks and the benefits and have a discussion with the patient about that. Seizures are a risk with interferon beta, thrombotic microangiopathy, and you're gonna carefully monitor patients on interferon if they have a history of myelosuppression. On oral DMT, uh, therapies, uh, let's talk first about fingolimod. So fingolimod has several contraindications. Recent within six months of MI, unstable angina, stroke, TIA, decompensated heart failure, and or class three or four heart failure. History or presence of MOBITS II second degree or third degree heart block or sick sinus syndrome, unless the patient has a pacemaker. A baseline QTC interval of greater than or equal to 500 milliseconds. Those patients with cardiac arrhythmias requiring antiarrhythmic treatment, and those women that may be pregnant or breastfeeding. These are all contraindications for fingolimod. Saponimod, which is the newest S1P receptor modulator, the contraindications are as above listed at A, B, D, and E. And with saponimod, we also need to do genotyping. Those patients who have CYP2C star 3 star 3 genotyping, saponamod would be contraindicated for those patients. Other oral therapies including, or include teraflunamide. Patients who have severe hepatic impairment, teraflunamide would be contraindicated. Concurrent use of leflunamide, active hepatitis or tuberculosis, and once again, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Cladribine has contraindications. Patients with a current malignancy, those patients with active chronic hepatitis or tuberculosis, HIV, and pregnancy and breastfeeding. With the infusion DMTs, we'll talk now about ocrelizumab. Ocrelizumab has several contraindications, considerations, and warnings. Patients who have active hepatitis B infection, ocrelizumab would be contraindicated for concerns about possible reactivation of hepatitis B. Once again, pregnancy and breastfeeding would be contraindicated. Uh, infections are a risk with ocrelizumab. There's also a possible increased risk of immunosuppressant effects if used with other immunosuppressants and malignancies. Alimtuzumab has several contraindications and warnings as well. Again, pregnancy and breastfeeding, those patients who have HIV infection, there may be an increased risk of other autoimmune mediated conditions. There is a risk of stroke or arterial dissections. There's an increased risk of malignancies, immune cytopenias, glomerulonephropathies, thyroid disorders, autoimmune hepatitis, infections, acute cholecystitis, and pneumonitis. So where, where are we now? Well, we do have some current dilemmas. Um, the clinical trials from the DMTs that we have currently largely exclude older patients and those with comorbidities. So when the drug is approved, we're using them in a population that has not been studied. The findings from the trials lack generalizability. We do have a need for observational studies that include this population. And we do have needs for clinical trials on the effect of comorbidity and disease-modifying therapies. In summary, comorbidities are common in MS. The management of comorbidities should be a multidisciplinary approach. We want to address lifestyle issues and comorbidities to optimize MS therapies. We want to encourage our MS patients to engage in wellness, health maintenance, and vascular risk factor control programs. And we want to use a model of shared decision making and careful consideration of comorbidities must also be included when recommending and considering disease modifying therapies. In conclusion, I wish everybody good health, stay strong, and be well. We are in this together. Hi, and welcome to the CMSC. My name is Jane Busey, and I am a clinical professor at Stony Brook University. I'm also a nurse practitioner at South Shore Neurologic, and both are on Long Island. 
Today I'm going to talk about critical thinking about vaccines and MS. Here are the accreditation and credit designation and in support of improving care, the consortium of MS, uh, MS centers is jointly accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, and the American Nurses Credentialing Center to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This presentation offers one contact hour of continuing education for physicians, nurses, pharmacists, PAs, psychologists, and social workers. And that's more of this. And uh, here are my disclosures. And here are my learning objectives. Hopefully by the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe the mechanisms of vaccines identify appropriate vaccines for persons with MS, discuss the AAN guidelines for vaccines in MS, recognize the impact DMTs have on vaccine efficacy, and realize the safety and efficacy concerns of fast-tracking vaccines. So here's the CDC recommended vaccines. There, um, I'm going to bring you to this website right now. And you will see how it comes up. It's, in, it's just a CDC website about the vaccine schedule for ages 19 and older. And if you look here, all of the vaccines that we would need are listed here. And the ones in yellow are the ones they strongly recommend. And then as you go to purple, it's dependent upon age and um, other factors. So the CDC is very clear about all of these vaccines and the ones that we should get. When we talk about vaccines, most of the time, uh, everybody mounts a good response, a good antibody response. However, sometimes there's primary vaccine failure. And we get concerned about this, and I've seen it in MS. When you give, um, for instance, VZV vaccine, and then you wait for the titers to come back, and the titers don't come back, Hi, the, the person had mounted no response. We gave the VZ, VZV vaccine again, and still we have the same problem. And so over time, the question is, can the patient take a DMT if they do not mount an appropriate response? And why aren't these patients mounting appropriate response? Well, in the literature, it says that about two to 10% of patients do not induce, uh, vaccines do not induce any immunology immunological response. So it is something that we do see periodically. And most of the time, primary non-responders have, have T cell deficiencies. And, and for our patients that we have when we see this, we'll send them off to infectious, um, infectious disease providers to see if we can start them on DMTs and which ones we should start them on. Other problems with some of these vaccines are that there's something called secondary vaccine failure, which is the immunity has waned over the past few years. And there are two things that will affect um, whether or not the, vaccine, the person will mount the appropriate antibodies. First of all, immunosenescence contributes to poor outcomes of antibodies. So as our, as our patients age, and if we wanna give them vaccines, we have to be very concerned, will they mount the appropriate response? And in the United States, as we're all very aware, obesity is a big problem. And obesity can have a negative impact on some vaccine outcomes. So as you're thinking of um, vaccinating your patients, you have to think about all these other items also. So immunogenicity of vaccines. Well, what we do know is that vaccine-induced protection is a very complex issue. And so there's this whole cascade of mechanisms and mediators, as, I, as you can see on this slide. And the biggest thing is the, the vaccines must be capable of activating the antigen presenting cell system to create this immunogenic potential so that you do get a humoral response to the vaccine. Here is a graphic of that very situation. So there, depending on whether it is a, um, an IM, a sub-Q, um, ingestion, oral or nasal, whatever it is, the vaccine enters the body and leads to attraction, activation, 
uptake and processing by the antigen presenting cells. And then the APCs activate lymphocytes and cause a T cell immuno, immune response and activation of B cells. There's, the primary response initially is very short lived. And so over time, there, this primary response is replaced by the secondary response, which gives memory T cells and memory B cells. And that's really what we need for the vaccine to work. In vaccine, in almost every vaccine, there's a vaccine adjuvant. And these are inactivated um, particles that are combined with the inactivated vaccine antigen. And what these adjuvants do is they increase and modulate the vaccine's immunogenicity. It makes that vaccine last longer and more effective, and they activate the immune cells better. The most widely used adjuvant is called aluminum salts. And they are added, all these adjuvants are added to almost every vaccine. So are we getting a good vaccine response? Well, that varies upon the type of vaccine administration, the kind of vaccine, and the choice of adjuvant. People have looked up the choice of adjuvant for a long time because they're wondering if they can theoretically cause problems in immune diseases. Do they cause immune diseases? Do they make immune diseases worse? And there's been association in the literature and the general media has gotten a hold of this. And as um, our president likes to say, fake news, um, sometimes these things end up being fake news. Most frequently, there's been a lot of um, discussion about uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and that is with influenza vaccine, and that has occurred in a very small number of patients, yet it gets a lot of press. And there have been controlled studies of autoimmune, autoimmunity post-immunization, and there is no evidence that one causes the other. Now, do vaccines um, and cause inflama inflammatory diseases of the CNS? Well, inflammatory diseases are very multifactorial diseases and they're very complex. And they're dependent upon environmental triggers and genetic factors. Those things collectively promote loss of immune tolerance. And so when you look at this you say, and you give a vaccine, is there any association between vaccine infections and autoimmune diseases? And there's been some intense debate about that, and it can be problematic because what happens is it hasn't been substantiated. However, um, people that get very concerned about taking vaccines because they're afraid of such diseases. But pathological reactions to vaccines are very rare, and that's something that we really have to impress upon our patients, especially if they don't want to take the vaccines we feel are necessary for them for their MS. Do vaccines cause MS? Well, MS, we know, is thought to be caused by immune-mediated mechanisms, and vaccines cause various effects on the immune system but they depend on the cell types engaged by the vaccine. And really there's no data, there's such little data either way, if do vaccines cause MS or do they not cause MS? However, at the present time, it cannot be completely excluded because there's such little data. Specific vaccines causing MS that have been um, studied, there is insufficient evidence to support or refute any association with the following vaccines. Um, diphtheria, hepatitis, measles, meningitis, mumps, pertussis, polio, rubella, smallpox, tuberculosis, typhoid, and zoster. So for the main group of, max, of vaccines, there's very insufficient data. Um, yellow fever vaccination, however, is the total opposite. There's a lot of information that it may increase the risk of relapse. Um, when hepatitis B came out in the 90s and HPV in the 2000s, 2010s, there were big concerns that these might cause MS, but there have been very large scale epidemiological studies since that time that have shown that this is negative. There is no relation bet relationship between hepatitis B or HPV vaccine. 
some case reports and case control studies have come out and they've shown interesting um, cases of post-vaccine CNS diseases. For instance, just recently in the March-April International Journal of MS Care, um, there was a case report and there were, it was a case of neuromyelitis optica. So the authors looked at 72 cases of demyelination from 2008 and 2018. And what they found was 72 cases. I'm sorry, they looked at all the cases and um, did a literature review. They found 72 cases of demyelination. The, the highest group was ADEM, 32 cases. Um, but these case control studies are not replicated in larger studies. There are no case, the case reports are just individual and anecdotal at this time. Class two case control studies did not show any increased risk for MS and data is scarce that MS can be caused by vaccines. Immunization and MS. So just in August of 2019, the AAN guidelines came out. It was a systematic review and they came out with some major recommendations. First of all, all clinicians should discuss immunizations, immunizations with their patients and, recommend, and they recommend local vaccine standards to be followed. So depending on where you live, whatever the local vaccine standards are, they should be followed. Everyone should receive the influenza vaccine yearly and we should counsel the patients individually and assess for other risks. We have to, now we, we're gonna talk about immunizations and DMTs. We have to counsel patients on infection risks with DMTs and we pretty much know what those infection risks are because our DMTs have, many of them have been out for a long time. There are treatment specific guidelines in the um, product um, information we should vaccinate four to six weeks prior to the start of a DMT. Any live vaccines should be done four to six weeks prior to the start of the, of the DMT. We should screen and, infect, and, tr and um, treat infections prior to DMT start. We should screen for Hep B. They recommend against any live attenuated vaccines while, we're, while undergoing um, disease modifying treatment and do not vaccinate during a relapse. Effectiveness of inactivated vaccines, that the data is really only available for influenza. It depends on the d disease modifying treatment. For instance, interferon beta, it's probably no reduction in seroprotection. However, GA, there might be a possible reduced seroprotection. Fingolimod, probable reduced seroprotection, and there's insufficient evidence regarding natalizumab, teraflutamide, or alemtuzumab. Ocrelizumab in the PI is reduced seroprotection. Dimethylfumarate has no reduced seroprotection in pneumococcal, men meningococcal, or tetanus. There are specific DMTs and effectiveness of vaccine, like saponamod, there's a general statement on all vaccines during treatment and up to one month after it may be less effective. In ocrelizumab, there was a small study that showed attenuated responses during treatment for tetanus toxoid, pneumococcal, and seasonal um, influenza vaccines. In Mavenclad, in clinical trials, very, there were very few vaccines, but mostly they were influenza. And there is no adverse events associated with the administration of vaccines up to this point. Rituximab, there's, because it's off-label for MS, there's no MS evidence, but from the RA data, rheumatoid arthritis data, they say it profoundly reduces influenza and pneumococcal vaccine immunogenicity. And vaccines should be timed before rituximab or six months after rituximab for better humoral results. The timing of, of vaccination is very important. And the consensus here is mostly for the immunosuppressive treatments with DMTs. It should be given, at le vaccines should be given at least two weeks prior for inactivated vaccines and at least four weeks prior for live vaccines. And we should distinguish between 
initial vaccinations and boosters. And when we do have, our, when we are putting a patient on a DMT for the first time, we do check all of um, their titers to see if they need boosters or if they have been vaccinated. And the question about refractory time after immunosuppression, we're not quite sure with some medications and they may be up to one year, depending on the medication. Pretty much depends on when those B cells repopulate. So um, rituximab or alemtuzumab, can, the refractory time may be up to one year. Um, efficacy of vaccinations, data on efficacy combined with available MS medications is missing. The outcome of the vaccine is difficult to predict. When possible, we should have our patients do an antibody test to see if they have mounted the appropriate response. Vaccine hesitancy. Now, this is something that's gained traction in the United States recently. And um, the World Health Organization causes, calls it one of the most top 10 threats to global health people who do not want to vaccinate their children or get vaccines. Since um, vaccine hesitancy came into vogue, um, anti-vaxxers, they call them in our region, 30, there's been a 30% increase in measles cases worldwide. This is something we had thought we had eradicated, and now because of vaccine hesitancy, it's back. We, we have to say to our patients, the usefulness of active immunization is undisputed. We know it works, and perhaps there is some, occasionally some small problem with it, but those really bad diseases are so rare and they have not been shown to be caused by vaccination. There is fear of possible, but often unconfirmed side effects, and is very often media driven. Side effects from vaccinations are rare, and the benefits for individuals and populations will outweigh the adverse event effects. So we have two problems here. We have the missing protection for the vaccinated person themselves, but we also have the risk for people who are not able to get vaccinated. So anybody who's immunosuppressed on chemotherapy, having other issues, they cannot get vaccinated. And, and if they get measles, it is a huge problem. So we really, as healthcare providers, have to push for vaccination. Um, also with vac um, vaccine hesitancy, there's missing herd immu immunity, which poses, poses a major problem for MS. Um, immunosuppressive treatments with acute infection can have dangerous sequelae, we know that. And we're trying everything we can to keep our patients safe. So we, once again, we vaccinate prior to DMTs, because the benefits outweigh all the possible risks. So I wanted to just talk about this vaccination because it seems in the pandemic that we're in right now, people are in a rush to um, get to create vaccinations. And I think there are, from the news I heard, maybe 90 companies trying to get an appropriate vaccine, which is wonderful. And in the pandemic of, um, H1N1, which was in 2009-2010, um, there was a massive vaccination campaign worldwide. Everybody, again, was trying to find the appropriate vaccination. And so at that time, there was something, a newly developed monovent influenza vaccine called Pandemrix, Pandemic, Rix, Pandemrix. And it was licensed through fast track procedures. And this vaccine, which we're not sure what caused the problems, but this particular vaccine that was given in Northern Europe, not other places, can, in Canada, they had different vaccines. Um, they, afterwards, they found that there were more than 1,300 cases of narcolepsy, cataplexy in children and adults. And that was after the vaccine. So what caused that? And to this date, nobody is quite sure. Was it the particular combination of the virus um, and the adjuvant? Was it the genetics of the children and the adolescents? Nobody's sure, but we do know that a different vaccine for the virus, um, just a slightly different strain of the vaccine was given in Canada and they did not see the same um, 
problems, the same disease. So for us, our patients and we are facing COVID-19. And because I live in New York, I'm sure many of you know that Governor Cuomo was not reopening up our state until we don't even know when. We're hopeful in the next two, three, four months. But whenever he reopens it, it's going to be very different. So we're all looking for antibody tests. We're looking for new vaccines, a vaccine that can possibly help us um, get through this so that we all could get vaccinated and move on with our lives like we'd like to do. And so all of these vaccines, as I said, are being fast-tracked. I think I heard that some might be available at the end of August, which is just remarkable because as people are, the scientists, the research are saying, it usually takes years. So in Sunday, May 3rd's New York Times, I read this quote and I thought that this is something very important for our, our patients and very important for us as we move forward. Seven of the roughly 90 vaccine projects being pursued have reached the stage of clinical trials, moving ahead at unheard of speeds. But uncertainty remains over effectiveness. How quickly a vaccine could be made available to millions or billions of people and whether the rush will sacrifice safety. And I think that's something we have to all be aware of. Will, will the rush sacrifice safety? Everybody keep safe. Thanks for attending.